Welcome to chapter 10 of the Linux Administration Master Course and things are going to get more practical now. Today we are going to talk about the most important tool um, that you'll use among all these uh, system level tools, which is the text editor. Text editors have been um, part of the system administration toolbox from the start and um, even when work with a computer wasn't as interactive as it is today um, there were still ways to edit files i wouldn't count punching paper cards into that but um, when uh, there was a possibility to interact with the computer directly in forms of in the form of terminals and we've already talked about that um, appeared uh, text editors appeared as well because you wanted to store data and on your computer and you wanted to be able to input and update that dynamically so even when uh, the only way to communicate with the computer was with a uh, teletype terminal which only um, had a keyboard and a, a printer that gave you its output on paper uh, there were already editors called line editors um, with which you could um, create and update text files only line by line, of course, because um, there was no way of navigating a file dynamically. But that changed when uh, CRT-based terminals came on the scene, as we've seen in uh, the previous um, chapter. And um, then we got interactive text editors. And nowadays, of course, we have graphical user interfaces with graphical editors as well. Why do we need text editors? as a system administrator well text editors were the first way of um, creating and updating text files and even though today we have very sophisticated ways to do word processing for example these tools uh, don't cover what we as system administrators need anymore so while you might be able to um, use um, a word processor like uh, libreoffice writer to create text files um, what we need isn't for word processing, but for manipulating plain text. And John uh, adds, because everything in Linux is a file, I see uh, the lessons are sinking in. Um, glad to see it. And um, so what we need is a way to um, manipulate text files that are pure ASCII or, um, I guess, uh, Unicode nowadays. But uh, we don't need um, any word processing uh, capabilities in our editors. And uh, I could cite another um, tenet of the Linux philosophy here. Um, use tools that have a single purpose and uh, that um, fulfill that purpose well. So um, instead of bunching the topic of word processing um, into a single tool, we could as well use um, one tool to create our um, raw text content and then another tool to then um, output a nicely typeset file and actually that's something that i'd like to do here um, simply to show you how in the early days text processing and uh, word processing worked and the interesting thing is that applies to today as well with the um, renaissance of uh, plain text and open formats like Markdown, for example, it's um, perfectly possible to use plain, plain text as the input to create a website, to create a document, uh, a typeset document, even an ebook, um, without having to use any kind of sophisticated word processing software. David Both. Um, mentions that um, Vim is one of the most interesting text editors because uh, it's so ubiquitous. Um, I'd like to add that Nano nowadays is as well. So you, you are not actually forced to use Vim because of its, its uh, prevalence. But um, yeah, um, 
David is definitely right that uh, it's a good choice. And I'm actually going to use Vim for the next demonstration, um, as I do work in uh, Vim on a daily basis. But there are a lot of options and we'll cover them a little bit later. So here I am in my course VM. Let me log in. Let's open a text editor in a terminal. And just to be sure, let me uh, make sure that Vim is actually installed. I can use the which command to uh, find the Vim command. And it's actually there in the user bin directory. So uh, we're good to go there. I guess I'll um, create a directory called um, typeset demo. And as discussed in an earlier chapter, I can easily change my present working directory to this new directory and use tab completion to save a little bit of typing. And uh, now I'm going to create a file that I'm going to use for typesetting. In the early days of Unix, the folks at uh, Bell Labs had to um, create text documents themselves. First and foremost, as the documentation for Unix itself, the manual pages that come with every Unix and Linux operating system are actually based on a format that um, was developed in the early days. And uh, here's the history of these early um, typesetting tools. The uh, grandfather of all these typesetting tools was Runoff, um, which ran on IBM mainframes with the CTSS operating system in the 1960s. Um, that then was emulated by uh, Ken Thompson and uh, the Multics team in the 1960s when they tried to create this new operating system that should um, then be become the uh, uh, main operating system on um, General Electric's mainframes. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned multiple times now, uh, Multics never got anywhere. But um, of course, um, all these ideas then um, traveled to Unix in the early 70s. And uh, Ken Thompson then uh, shortened the name of the tool from Runoff to Roth. And that's the tool they used to create man pages, manual pages with their headings and sections and all these things, but also to create actual text documents for business use. And uh, Roth actually became um, a key part in the Unix team getting a new computer because uh, Unix started its life on uh, a PDP-7 that uh, Ken Thompson um, had access to. But uh, when uh, his requirements uh, on uh, performance and things like that grew, um, he outgrew that machine and tried to get one of these newer generation uh, computers called the PDP-11. But um, he didn't get the funding. Uh, Bell Labs only realized the value of Unix a little bit later. So uh, Thompson had to find another way to get to a more beefy machine. And that opportunity presented itself when the patent department at Bell Labs needed a new computer to, um, to speed up their patent applications. So uh, creating documents was a big part of the patent department's work. And so they used computers for that. And uh, they needed a more beefy machine to uh, churn out even more patent applications. Um, as you probably know or can imagine, um, a a uh, huge research uh, institute like uh, Bell Labs churned out uh, patent applications on <laughs> at, uh, almost an, an hourly basis. So uh, Ken Thompson made a deal with the uh, uh, patent department. Um, you have the power to get funding for a new machine. 
And we have a great typesetting software that we can uh, maintain for you much, much better than your previous third-party vendor. And uh, the patent department agreed. They purchased a PDP-11 and the Unix team got to use that machine when the um, patent department didn't need it, i.e. at night. And uh, that's when Roth... Uh, and its later incarnations um, started uh, to proliferate. Later, uh, we got um, different versions. Um, there was NROF and later then TROF. ROF and NROF, uh, where NROF st stands for New ROF, um, still uh, output text. Uh, plain text for uh, printing directly on paper without much embellishment, uh, but in a nicely formatted way, so um, that uh, headings, for example, were nicely centered and uh, had a little bit of vertical space around them and things like that. But uh, when uh, Bell Labs got a typesetting machine that could actually um, uh, output print quality or book quality uh, papers, uh, NROF then was um, improved to TROF, the typesetting ROF. And nowadays we have GROF on our Linux machines. That's the ROF version by the GNU project. And that's exactly what I'm going to use for my demonstration. So um, the first thing that I need to do is make sure that um, I have GROF available. So what I'm going to do is use the DNF command and its search function to search for GROF. Simply to find out which packages I'm going to need. And package management will also be covered more in depth. DNF is updating all its package sources and now it tells me which packages there are available and I'll use sudo to install these packages via DNF. Um, I'll add the dash Y option to uh, speed things up. And I will use the Groth base package. Uh, maybe let's start with the Groth package, but also the Groth base package. And I'll also need the Groth all package. That was quick. So if I do which Groth, I can see it's also installed in user bin. All right. What I have to do now is to create a text file that contains the uh, text that I'd like to typeset. And uh, I'll use the Vim editor to create this. And we'll call this file um, texteditors.me. And I'll get to that in a little bit, why it's .me. The Vim editor opens. And um, What's important about Vim is that Vim works in different modes. That's one of the first things that confuse people when they uh, get into Vim, either intentional or by accident. Uh, Vim doesn't accept any input fr uh, from the start because it's in what's called the normal mode, where uh, it expects to have uh, to input uh, where it expects you to input commands. So the first command that I need to issue here is the I command, which then switches Vim into the insert mode. 
And um, all these modes seem to be very complicated and remind us of these early line editors um, where people had to edit files line by line on a teletype uh, where you would actually have to have this separation of modes to um, differentiate between do I want to tell the text editor something or do I simply want to input text into that text editor and uh, so um, these line editors always worked in a modal way where you would switch between a command mode or uh, normal mode which it, uh, how, how it's called in uh, vim or vi and um, the input mode uh, it seems archaic that vim still keeps this modal way of doing things but uh, actually it's uh, a really great way to interact with a text editor efficiently and uh, i might get into that a little bit later but let's uh, focus on the uh, demonstration. So I'd like to actually typeset the first few paragraphs of this chapter in our course material. So um, uh, I'll start with a chapter heading um, for with the text text editors. This uh, These rough tools accept instructions in the form of a period followed by a command and the first command that I'll issue is plus C, which defines a chapter heading. And um, there needs to be one argument behind it. So if you have multiple words, you need to um, group them inside quotes. So I'll write the uh, chapter heading text editors. And then um, we'll go right into the first section, which is the objectives section. And that is done with the uh, uh command which is an unnumbered heading because um this heading uh the the subsections in chapters in david both's book aren't numbered so um i can uh leave off the quotes because it's just one word objectives and then we'll start a paragraph using the pp command and everything else that is on its own line without a leading dot or period is text. So I can now start writing in this chapter, you will learn. And if you have the book in front of you, you'll uh, know that um, now there comes a bullet point list with the different objectives of this chapter. And uh, bullets are done with the dot bu command. And uh, the first bullet is why editors are needed. No, not white editors are needed. Interesting what my brain does. Uh, why editors are needed. We had the question by uh, Sean. Would it be okay to say that LaTeX is a modern typesetting program slash system? Yes. Um, and of course, um, everyone who's familiar with uh, LaTeX uh, recognizes how uh, this uh, rough typesetting works by interspersing commands with the actual text content. Um, but uh, there's a lot of years between rough and uh, tech, actually, and then LaTeX, which is a macro package on top of tech. Okay, folks, uh, let's continue on. We were at why editors are needed. Now I'll do my next bullet point. about several text editors, some intended or use. Now, as these lines get longer, I can do a line break wherever I want. Um, they'll be kept together as a single bullet point without any line breaks in there. Uh, I would have to force a line break if I wanted one. So I can actually do a line break here just to make sure the line doesn't get too long for use in a terminal session and others for the GUI desktop. Next bullet point. 
how to use the Vim text editor. Next bullet, why you should use the text editor of your choice and why it's... Oh no, sorry, that wasn't in the book. And the bullet point list then um, automatically ends when I add a new type of section. Exactly, ex ex exegete why, because it's, um, and why it's near Vim, of course, if it's Vim. Um, now uh, there's a new uh, section heading with multiple words this time, which I'll have to um, group together in quotes, why we need text editors. And let's start a new paragraph below that heading. Before there were word processing programs, there were text editors. The init initial use for early text editors was for the creation and maintenance of text files such as shell scripts, programs written in C, and other programming languages, and system configuration files. And all these kinds of files had in common that they were plain text in um, back then in um, ASCII uh, text with uh, no um, with almost and without almost any uh, special characters. Of course, the normal interpunction characters were available as well. New paragraph, and that's the last paragraph that I'll type in. No worries, I'm not going to rewrite this book. Document. Preparation software such as LaTeX was developed to automate the process of typesetting various types of documents, particularly technical documents and journals. So uh, that's also a um, reminder that uh, the people with, who uh, developed Unix um, needed to um, create these technical documents and journals and um, uh, magazine articles or conference articles. And uh, they all had to be uh, at least nicely formatted, if not typeset. And uh, so uh, these early word processing solutions were really important. Uh, let me see. Uh, is there anything else we need? Ah, yes. Uh, let's add a footnote that um, this is actually from uh, our course material. And in order to create a footnote, I need to um, start one, which is done by the uh, opening parentheses followed by an F for footnote. And then I can write from D both using and administering oh dear administering linux volume 1 copyright david both 2020 and then i'll end my 
footnote the same way. I'll close the parentheses and uh, add another F. And uh, by pressing the escape key, I can now switch back from input mode into command mode. And that's also the way how we actually um, now can leave uh, Vim, which is, of course, uh, a huge meme by now. And uh, let me simply show you how. I'll uh, press the colon key to get into command mode. And now I can actually write a command. And uh, I'll use the W command to write this file. This now has created this file, texteditors.me, with 30 lines and 883 bytes. And uh, by going back into command mode with the colon key and entering Q for quit, I can exit Vim. I could also have combined both by writing both commands in sequence, W to write it and then Q to quit it. And if you want to uh, um, make sure the file is there, we can, for example, use the less command and simply enter TE and press tab to autocomplete. And as you can see, we now have um, the uh, file here. And um, the reason why this uh, file ends with .me is why, because I'm using the um, extended command set of the me macro package that's a part of GROF. Um, that uh, gives me, for example, the command for the chapter heading, which isn't built into the uh, pure and uh, simple ROF. Um, there are macro packages that add additional features, and the ME macro package is one of the more popular ones. So, and now I can actually typeset this. Uh, let me try and remember how. Uh, that is by using GROF with dash T to define the target format, which is going to be PDF. And the uh, dash ME option to include the ME macro package. And then I'll simply uh, give the um, source file and Groff will output uh, the resulting um, document on standard out. And now we are, uh, since we are outputting uh, PDF, uh, that won't be of much use to um, get that on screen. And as part of the terminal, um, that'll just uh, clutter everything. So I'll use the uh, standard out redirection with the greater than sign and write that to a fitting uh, new file. And uh, yeah, it's quite uh, easy to tell that this is going to be texteditors.pdf. Okay, so there is a package missing, apparently. Um, Groff tells me cannot compress this PDF. I'm not sure if this just this is just a warning. I didn't get it on my workstation because for, um, by co coincidence, this uh, per module was available uh, on my workstation, but not on this uh, freshly installed VM. Uh, let me see if there is a uh, proper PDF file here. Judging by, their, uh, by the fact that there is a text editors.pdf with 15 kilobytes, um, I guess uh, that should be okay. It's just not going to be compressed, but at 15 kilobytes, I shouldn't worry about that. And um, now we need to try and take a look at this text file. So I'll go and open uh, the demo folder here. Oops, no, that's the wrong folder. It's a typeset demo. So here we have our two files. And if I open pdf, let's hope this works. Yes, it does. So as you can see, um, this is all nicely typeset with a nice times font with the uh, chapter title and the chapter heading here. 
One thing that is off is that, uh, of course, Giroff started numbering my chapter with one, and that's, of course, not correct. Um, it should be uh, uh, chapter 10, but we can fix that. So let me go back into the um, document. Let's do another vim texteditors.me. And um, I can manipulate the chapter numbers, which get um, increased every time there is a plus C uh, command. So by preceding that with the command dot NR, which lets me set um, what's called a register. And uh, by setting the CH register, which contains the chapter numbers, to 9, this will then increment it by the plus C command here to 10 and we'll get the correct chapter heading or chapter number. Let's save that with colon WQ. Let's use our arrow keys to get back the Groff command here. And if I go and open my PDF file a second time, now the chapter number is correct. As you can see, it's, it might be a little bit unusual for many people to create a document in this way, but it's not too complicated. Once you are familiar with the um, available commands that uh, influence the typesetting, um, this is a pretty straightforward way to create uh, documents that look rather nicely. And I uh, do prefer using these um, tools over uh, the now common graphical typesetting and word processing um, applications because I can work with plain text and plain text has so many advantages. I can, um, for example, use all the uh, available shell commands, some of which we have already seen, shell commands like grep to um, filter specific lines um, and uh, many other tools to manipulate these text files. I can also use what's called version management to keep um, backups of all uh, states of my documents over time and I can go back to how the document looked two weeks ago, things like that. And that's easily possible with um, plain text files, but um, not really um, practical with uh, more complex formats like the ones used by, for example, LibreOffice. Tinsler asked, do you know whether the people entering trough code back then always were developers in the sense that they were fluent in a programming language like C? Mm, nope. For example, um, I'm pretty sure that in the uh, patent applications case, these were people in the patent, ap uh, in the patent department uh, of Bell Labs. Uh, I would assume it was mostly women um, being tasked with uh, entering all these patent application texts. And uh, these people um, used the uh, um, rough commands as I did now. Um, I think we can imagine that uh, it, uh, after say, a week using ROF, you would be pretty familiar, especially if you uh, were able to look on existing documents, because, of course, patent applications follow a specific template and uh, don't deviate from that template much. And so um, you knew what to use for the title and for the name of the person filing the patent and all these things for the date um, and so on and so on. Because, um, yeah, that's... Uh, I, I would assume these weren't developers. These were um, more people like data typists, secretaries, something in, in, in uh, that vein. But of course, um, the whole research arm uh, of Bell Labs, with its many um, scientific, uh, full of scientists, physicists, um, electrical engineers, computer scientists, mathemat mathematicians, all these kinds of people, of course, um, had had probably uh, only a few issues with um, uh, doing text processing this way because um, 
I mean, compared to the way uh, you would do it without a computer, you ha would have to sit in front of a typewriter. And um, if you made um, an error that, um, for example, you forgot to type uh, a word, uh, all you could do was throw away the page and start typing it from fresh. Um, and uh, so uh, these new uh, computer-based word processing systems were far superior to that approach. Tinsaw goes on to write, I'm curious because in my career I often encountered the argument <clears throat> if a solution uses a markup language like HTML, XML, Markdown, it's not suitable for humans. No, I disagree. It's probably not suited for um, novices, for people who aren't familiar with these markup languages. But uh, since you mention XML, I mean, you can do um, a lot of confusing stuff with XML. On the other hand, there is SGML. And based on that, DocBook, which I did use um, uh, about 10 years ago to write long documents and course materials and things like that. SGML was invented especially as an... Um, uh, as a markup language for publishing texts. And of course, uh, it's uh, complex in the sense that, of course, if you need a lot of features because your document layout is complex, uh, then your source document will be complex as well. But still, being able to manipulate texts where you could easily, for example, run them through a spell checker, um, run them through a tool that um, replaces uh, specific formatting um, commands with other uh, formatting commands, things like that, um, that quickly makes you more efficient using these more open and plain text based uh, document formats. So I'm deeply convinced that they are uh, suitable for humans, for humans who have been properly trained. Tinsa goes on, and that third-party vendor application they stopped using in favor of Trough, did that work similarly with commands interspersed with the actual text? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Um, so... I only know that there was a specific problem that the vendor couldn't add new features quickly enough. And um, so that's when, when Thompson saw his opportunity to say, OK, uh, how about we provide you with a typesetting um, solution that we can maintain and we promise to um, uh, modify it to your uh, demands and things like that. Uh, so they became an in-house uh, application provider. and um, But I would imagine that it had to work the same way, I guess. Uh, there wasn't any graphical interfaces. And I don't think back in the early 70s, so in, in, in actual 1970, um, there, there wasn't any um, text-based word processor like uh, of the likes of, uh, say, WordStar, or then Microsoft Word, and things like that. That was a demo of um, early typesetting. And uh, getting back into that, actually, um, inspired me to get back into these um, text-based uh, typesetting systems like Roth or LaTeX or um, maybe even DocBook or something like that, because um, I always enjoyed uh, doing that. I, write, I wrote a whole book on Perl programming using LaTeX. Um, I think I created my course slides when I worked as a traveling um, Linux administration instructor with DocBook. So I have plenty of experience using these things, but uh, I haven't used them in, in quite a while. Now, let's get back to text editors. Um, 
there has been a lot of talk about Vim. Uh, the history is that uh, Vim has a few ancestors in the form of Ed, which uh, Ken Thompson uh, created in 1971, which is um, a line editor that's still shipped with Linux. Bill Joy then extended uh, its capabilities in the form of the X command, EX. And uh, uh, a few years later, then um, added a, uh, an, a, an interactive mode to X, which he called VI because it was a visual mode where you could actually navigate your cursor on the screen. And then uh, he extracted that visual mode out of X into its own um, software, which then also carried the name VI. Tim Thompson then created an editor for his Amiga in 1987, uh, which he called Steve V, of course, uh, uh, referencing VI, um, which was an extended version. And Bram Molinar in 1991 then created VI, Vim. Uh, and... Uh, just a few years ago, um, we got a new version of Vim, uh, a fork, basically, uh, in the form of NeoVim. And there are, of course, always uh, differences in terms of features, but I, I won't get into that. As already mentioned in the book and by myself, uh, Vim has the great advantage that it's available on virtually every Linux system. It's installed um, when you install Linux, as you saw, uh, even on my freshly installed uh, VM, there was already Vim installed. Uh, we didn't install that manually. It came out of the box. And that's the case with uh, almost every Linux system uh, on the planet. And um, that also got me into Vim because um, I could be sure that Whenever I logged in um, into one of the many servers of my company, I would find Vim as an editor, and I could count on that. So um, I saw it as an as a worthwhile investment uh, to learn the basics of Vim. For example, how to exit it, how to use it more efficiently, and um, then uh, I realized, well, why don't I use Vim? on my workstation as well. Uh, I could learn all the commands that people um, are praising Vim for, and then I, I would have one editor to rule them all. And that's exactly how I got into Vim. I used Vim for a few years and uh, later then switched to NeoVim. And uh, yeah, the, the rest is history, as they say. I'm very happy with that editor. And I do all my daily work in Vim, uh, regardless if it's software development or writing text documents. These slides that you can see on, on stream have been built using Vim. Um, my uh, websites uh, are built using Vim. Um, it's very versatile. And uh, it's definitely it definitely has its... Uh, um, learning curve that you need to master, but uh, it's very well worth it. Of course, there are other editors. There are lots of editors, of course, because um, editing text files is such a central task in system administration and beyond that, that, uh, of course, the, the many tastes and uh, preferences of people lead to a... Uh, multitude of choice. Um, one of the most uh, well-known editors besides Vim is, of course, Emacs. Emacs uh, was created by uh, the uh, founder of the Free Software Foundation, um, Richard Matthew Stallman, and um, it's also a very capable editor with many additional plugins that cover all kinds of stuff. And, of course, uh, you might be familiar with the uh, old 
<laughs> Sean already says, oh boy, here we go. Um, the old um, feud between Emacs users and Vim users, I'm not going to get into that. Uh, it's silly, and most most people know that it's silly. Um, and uh, yeah, so if you are looking for something uh, that's different from how Vim does stuff, uh, Emacs is definitely um, a good alternative options option. Uh, there's also G-Edit, which is a very capable um, editor. David Both also mentions uh, LeafPad. I'm not familiar with that myself. I, have, uh, I don't have any experience using LeafPad, but it um, might be a good option too. The KDE desktop environment comes, of course, with its own editor called Kate. And David also mentions XFW and uh, XED. Uh, I think they are um, older and uh, simpler text editors that still might be worth a look. But uh, I think um, the best option to start with is e either the editor that comes with your desktop environment. So the editor, for example, that comes with XFCE in our case, in this course, or the text editor that comes with KDE, or the one that comes with GNOME. All these environments have their default text editors. And then, of course, there's a lot of uh, third-party stuff as well that you can try over time. We are going to use Vim, not only because uh, I'm doing this course and uh, I can uh, decide uh, which editor I'll cover, but also because I find it um, useful for the reasons that I've already stated. As I already mentioned, Vim has these modes that you need to switch between. And the most important ones are the normal mode, in which um, uh, Vim expects you to press keys that then um, trigger uh, functions in, v in Vim. There's, of course, the insert mode that lets you insert text. That's the main purpose of this whole thing. There's the visual mode that um, allows you to select text and the command line mode uh, into which you get by pressing the colon key while in normal mode. Uh, which lets you then enter commands on a command line built into the uh, editor. Praxeus writes, uh, the advice I've been given is if you are new to the field, leave the editor wars alone, learn one and stay focused on the work. That's uh, valid and solid advice. I completely agree. Uh, let me demo these modes for you. Mm. Incorrect password. Oh dear. <laughs> so, uh, let me go back into my uh, text. If you start Vim, you will always be in normal mode. And um, as I've already explained, but it can't be explained uh, enough times, is you go into command mode with the colon key and you can see a cursor appear at the bottom of the terminal where it expects you to enter any kind of command. I can uh, type anything here. And there are short commands to um, write files, to exit the editor, or to ed uh, open a new file. So I can, for example, uh, use uh, the Q command to exit Vim, which I'm not going to do now, uh, by um, either pressing escape or um, simply deleting the colon, um, I'll go back into normal mode. Uh, then I can switch to insert mode uh, by pressing I, as you can see down in the status line, uh, I get now um, the uh, insert mode. And um, on the right of this status line, by, uh, by the way, you can see the line and the column I am in. I'm in line two, column eight at the moment. Now I can um, enter text. I can also 
use backspace to delete it. But um, at least in older versions of Vim, I wasn't able to move my cursor around. Um, now I can. Uh, more modern versions of Vim allow you to move your cursor around. So I can, for example, go to the beginning here and uh, change this chapter heading to important text editors. And this text simply gets inserted since I'm in insert mode. And I can leave insert mode at any time by pressing the escape key. And as I um, mentioned uh, in uh, earlier versions of Vim, you couldn't even move the cursor using the arrow keys. And that's simply because um, older terminals, which, as I uh, remind you, um, were the early ways to interact with, this com with computers, there wasn't even arrow keys. They only had the alphanumeric keys, uh, the alphabetical keys, numbers, um, and maybe a few additional functions. But um, oftentimes they didn't have any um, arrow keys. Or if they had, um, they were combined with the alphabetical keys. And that's how um, Vim actually got its early navigation keys, which are on the middle row of the keyboard in form of the four adjacent keys H, J, K and L. So um, the keys that your right hand uh, usually rest on um, if you... Um, uh, have a proper typing um, posture. And um, so uh, if the arrow keys don't work, I need to go back into normal mode, out of insert mode, and then I can use H and L, the outermost keys, to move left and right. I'm pressing L continuously to move the cursor to the right, and H to move it to the left. J goes down and K goes up. Praxeus asked, uh, didn't VI have HJKL compatibility? Not only did it have HJKL compatibility, it introduced HJ, K and L, um, because on uh, the um, uh, VT, no, it wasn't the VT100, was it? I think it was an earlier terminal uh, that Bill Joy used. And uh, it had its arrow keys on H, J, K, and L. And since he didn't want to press any special function combinations to activate the arrow keys in, in his terminal, he simply used the same keys, but the, their letter um, meanings, H, J, K, and L, to move around. And to this day, people use H, J, K, and L to move around in Vim. The reason why people do still use H, J, K and L instead of the arrow keys uh, will become clear in a minute. Just to finish the, the part on modes, the visual mode activates when you press V in the normal mode. So I press V. As you can see now, the status line displays visual. In, and if I move around now, you can see that text gets selected which allows me to uh, manipulate this whole selected section of text instead of doing it line by line. Again, by pressing escape, I leave the visual mode. And these are the four um, main modes that we need to cover here. Then we have motions, which means um, the uh, features that let you move around your text. And I've already covered H, J, K and L. And there are additional um, keys that you can use in normal mode to move around more quickly than uh, letter by letter. For example, by using the W key, I can move word by word to the right. So if I'm at the beginning of this line here and I press W, I jump forward one word. That also goes beyond one line. So if I press W now, I'll go to the next line. And if I press W now, then it jumps here 
and it basically uses white space and special characters as word boundaries. So um, if I press W now that I'm on the last word here, then it jumps to the um, end quote here. And then I, it jumps to the period and then to the next alpha uh, letter, which is the P. I can also go backwards by using the capital version of W's, or if I press Shift W. Oh, no, that's not the case. Okay, take that back. Um, of course, yeah, I was confused. Sorry. Um, speaking of back, uh, it's the B key, of course, where you can actually go back one word. So it's W forward one word be backwards one word and that's also a way to um, go to the end of a word which is um, luckily the e key the e jumps from one end of a word to the next these keys seem to be um, complicated to memorize but i can assure you once you have them memorized they are really great that's also a good way to jump to the beginning of a line and to the end of a line. And uh, that is by pressing zero, I go to the beginning of a line, which is uh, an easy mnemonic. Zero as the beginning of the uh, natural numbers. And um, the dollar sign jumps to the end of a line. There's also another key to get me at, to the beginning, and that's the carrot uh, on the 6. So by pressing Shift 6, um, I also jump to the beginning of a line. Let's make bigger jumps by pressing G two times. So by entering GG, I jump to the beginning of my file. And with capital G, so shift G, I jump to the end. And that already makes things quite um, efficient because I can jump to the beginning of a file, enter V uh, to get into visual mode, and then I press capital G to jump to the end of my uh, text. And almost the whole file is already selected but I'm at the beginning of the last line. So if I want to include these last three characters, the period, the closing parentheses, and the F, then I press dollar sign to get to the end of this line, and now everything is visually selected. Of course, that works also with a single line. So if I go to the beginning of a line with the caret, then I uh, press V for visual mode, and dollar to get to the end of the line, the whole line is selected and that's easy uh, even easier if i go into line selection mode by not pressing the lowercase v but the uppercase v uh, that automatically gets me into line selection mode uh, so if i jump uh, upwards here i always select full lines and not only parts of lines depending on where, where my cursor was Since in normal mode we have the whole keyboard for ourselves to um, use um, specific editor features, um, that allows us to do even more um, efficient things. For example, I can jump to specific characters. I might be at the beginning of this line, but I'd like to jump to the comma. Of course, that's already quite fast by pressing W, one, two, three, four, five, six times. But there's a much easier way. Um, and uh, that, I guess, uh, really makes uh, VI for visual editor um, deserve its name. I can simply press the F key for find and then the character I'm looking for. So by pressing F, comma, I jump right to the next comma that's in this line. 
And I can do the same uh, if I want to jump to the um, period at the end of this sentence. I simply press F, period. This also works in reverse by using capital F. So I can, for example, jump back to the next T by pressing capital F, T. And by doing that another time, capital F, T, I go to the next T in line. And uh, there are a lot of T's in this line. But now we are at the first T in this line, so I can't go any more to the left. That's also a variant that um, gets me right in front of the character that I'm looking for. So if I want to insert something before the comma separates the um, sentence, I can use T for two, um, so T-O, to jump in front of the comma by pressing T comma. I'm now at the S and I can now append more um, text here by switching into insert mode but after this cursor by pressing A, which means append. So if I want to append behind this S, I press A. As you can see, I'm now in insert mode. And press escape to exit insert mode again. With Things like F and T, we are already quite efficient, but there's still more. Because I can tell Vim to repeat a motion. So, for example, if I'm at the beginning of this line and I want to go upwards to the uh, line with the section heading, so I want to go up two lines. Of course I can press K two times, but I can also precede K with a 2, with the number 2, so I press 2K and it does it. I can press 5K and it'll go up five lines. Or I could use 3W to jump forward three words. 3W. I could also um, jump to the second T after this cursor by pressing 2FT. So it didn't jump to the T at the beginning of text. It jumped right to the T at the end of text. And that especially gets um, very efficient if we switch on relative numbers. Uh, I should have uh, memorized how to do that. Of course, my own Vim has these things already built into its configuration. Uh, but uh, do I do that? I think it's just blank one, right? Yep. Yeah. Nope, it's just the relative number. I, uh, the, the one actually was uh, extraneous. Okay. Now you can see to the left there isn't uh, a line number, but there are relative line numbers. So I can actually see how far below or above the text that I want to navigate to is. So if I want to jump to the footnote down there, I don't have to count how many lines that is. Um, as you can see, uh, the next bullet point would be one line down and the footnote would be 15 lines down. So all I need to do to get there is to enter 15J, which means um, go down 15 lines and I'm here. If I want to go back to the section heading, I simply press 11K and I'm up there. Ape Baby writes, uh, I'm using set NU and line number. GG. Okay. 
let's try that. Okay, um, that makes sense. Uh, the NU um, adds to the relative numbers so that you can at least see uh, on which absolute line you are at the moment. So if I move down, you can see the next line will be line 19. The relative numbers change when I move and uh, the uh, line number here also um, is shown. That also helps with navigation. Because um, the other way to to do my uh, to do motions would be to use absolute numbers. So um, uh, wait, let's uh, is it off? No, how does it work? I don't remember how to um, unset a, a configuration in in Vim. Mm. Let's find out. Oh, no relative. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, just precede the... Yep, and that gives me the absolute line numbers. And... Um, by using the capital G, uh, capital G key um, that I introduced you to to jump to the end of the um, file, I can also precede that with an absolute line number. So if I want to jump to the footnote down there, that's on uh, line number 29. So by simply entering 29G, I get there as well. But um, I can't use the... Um, uh, the movement keys like J and K with that uh, in a practical way. So I do prefer relative line numbers with that um, absolute line number for where I'm at at the moment. Thanks for that, Ape Baby. And uh, welcome to the stream, by the way. Okay. Um, so let's summarize this. Since I write, wow, things like 2F or 5W are really impressive. I only now realize that despite modern non-model editors or word processors feeling easier, navigation is really so inefficient as the user has to repeat key presses an awful lot or even move a hand to the mouse. Exactly. This all seems so archaic until you get this realization that Tinstar just uh, shared with us, that... Uh, by memorizing these still pretty simple um, uh, concepts, uh, you get much more efficient. And wait till we get into editing. As I already explained, the lowercase i gets you into insert mode. I also used A to append. The only difference is that the um, cursor goes uh, one step to the right and then starts inserting. There's also the capital I and capital A um, commands. Capital A, for example, jumps to the end of a line and then goes into insert mode. So that's an easy way to append to the end of the existing line. By using lowercase or uppercase O, you can insert a line below your cursor or respectively above your cursor. And then uh, there are the uh, copy and paste commands that um, are uh, connected with the D, C, Y and P keys. So let's go and test those out. We've already seen A and I, which both um, insert text. So I'd say let's do the opposite now. If I go to this uh, previous paragraph here and I want to uh, delete a uh, well, let's start small, delete a single character, that's simply the X key. And especially if you um, 
had to type stuff on uh, a typewriter, you might still remember that um, simply typing an X over existing text was the common way to uh, make parts of your text invalid. Um, uh, so that was a way to correct things by Xing at it out. Um, and so uh, it's pretty natural to use the X key to delete a key. But, um, of course, uh, single, deleting single keys is a little bit, uh, single uh, characters is a little bit tedious. So, for example, if I wanted to delete this whole word, I would have to press X four times, right? No, of course not. I can simply enter four X. That's great. By the way, how do I get the soon back? Um, that's the U that, of course, stands for undo, uh, with which I can un make uh, revert changes. Remetsu uh, steals, me, steals the limelight from me. Um, yeah, there are um, more efficient ways to do things. Um, there is, of course, the D command. And the D command deletes what uh, you enter after it. So, for example, if I want to do the same thing that um, X does, I would simply press D and L, which means delete one character to the right. D, L deletes the S. I can also go to the end of uh, the word and press D H and since H goes to the left so does this deletion. I'm still in normal mode so um, uh, I can do more editing commands now. And uh, now we'll get to uh, what blew my mind when I, when I uh, grokked that. All these motion commands can also be applied with commands like D. So if I want to delete a whole word, I don't use W to simply move to the next word. I can press DW to delete to the next word in a more abstract sense, because word in this case is the comma, uh, everything um, that is separated by either special characters or white space. So DW deletes my word here. I can, of course, also delete the word and the comma by, again, putting a number in front of it. By pressing 2DW, it deletes both the word and the comma, which Vim regards as another word. So, if I want to include the word document in my deletion, I press 3DW. What if I want to delete everything, the rest of this line? Well, what's the motion that gets me to the end of the line? That's the dollar sign. By pressing D dollar, I delete everything to the end of the line. What if I'm here and I want to delete the um, partial sentence sentence in front of it? Well, I press D caret because caret gets me to the beginning of the line. I could have also used D zero because zero does the same thing. And it deletes to the um, uh, beginning of the line. If I want to um, delete this line and the next line, I can simply press D to J. Oh, that was one too many. So it's D J actually. Which deletes this line and the next line. There's an easier way, because uh, D followed by a D, so DD, which is quite e e e simple to uh, type, DD deletes a single line, 
And of course, 2DD deletes two lines. If I want to delete a word, but my um, cursor is in the middle of this word, DW will only um, delete from my cursor to the end of this word. So we'll only delete the part that's right to my cursor, but not the part that's in front of it. Thankfully, Vim also has a way to for me to express I'm in the middle of a word and I want to delete this one. And that's I for inside. By pressing D, I, W, I delete everything in which my cursor is in at the moment. So if I'm in the middle of a word, D-I-W gets this word deleted. Since we are at it, if I'm in the middle of this quote, of this section heading here, and I want to completely replace it, that's also possible. I don't want to delete inside a word. I want to delete inside a pair of quotes. And of course, I can do that by pressing DI and quote sign. DI quote deletes everything that's inside these quotes. But I said I wanted to replace it. So I could, of course, do di quote sign to get, uh, clear everything and then i to get back into um, insert mode. Um, with the c command, which stands for change, um, we have that already built in. So I can actually press ci quote sign. And it also deletes everything. But as you can see in the status line at the bottom of the terminal, I'm already in insert mode now. Um, and uh, I can type right ahead. By the way, the same works with parentheses as well. If I want to um, change this uh, parentheses here, I can actually press CI parentheses and uh, it'll delete everything in these parentheses and allow me to insert something new. If I want to get rid of it completely, I can also say um, delete the uh, outer um, separators as well by pressing DA parentheses. And that deletes the parentheses with their content. And the last command uh, that's uh, handy for editing, and I don't want to uh, extend this, this too much, um, is the dot command, which simply repeats what I did before. So if I um, want to delete a few words, and I don't want to think about numbers and things like that, I can simply press DW. And when I press the period, um, it'll simply repeat what I just did and keeps deleting words. Or if I deleted lines by using a single DD, I can also use the period command to keep deleting lines. Now that I've destroyed this file, um, there is a way to get it back, uh, uh, provided I haven't saved it yet, simply by going to the command line using the colon key and then pressing E, uh, I can uh, edit the same file again. So it'll open this file again. Uh, however, if I do this, it tells me no write since last change. So it doesn't let me leave this 
uh, state of the file without saving it, except if I add the exclamation mark to force it. So I press E exclamation mark and it'll reopen um, the file as it was on disk. Oh, I didn't um, talk about the uh, what you could call a clipboard. In Vim, they are called registers because there are more than one clipboard. Um, so let's do this. Um, and then we are done with basic v, uh, VI editing. Um, uh, if, I de if I've deleted a uh, line, it's actually stored in uh, a so-called register. And by pressing P, I can insert it after the um, cursor or at the cursor if I use capital P. So by pressing capital key in line 27 here, um, I can reinsert this line. Or the uh, lowercase p command will insert it after uh, the cursor, in this case after line 24. Um, and that way the line appears below it. I can also copy uh, stuff into this register and um, I guess for the most part we are going to copy whole lines and I can do that by pressing Y twice. Now line 25 is in the register and I can again use P for paste to insert it at the cursor or after the cursor, depending on if I want the cursor to move or not. Fix writes, uh, E exclamation mark is handy to know. Frequently I forget to enter insert mode and start typing and it does a bunch of weird things. Yeah, because the stuff that you in enter are interpreted as commands. Usually I quit and open the file again. Uh, that's one way. E exclamation mark will, will uh, help you as well uh, if you haven't saved it yet. Or of course you can simply use U to undo uh, single changes. But um, if uh, things are in too uh, bad a state then uh, uh, E exclamation mark is certainly a good way to go about it. So yeah, uh, let's go back to my slide here. So we covered I and A to, insert, uh, to uh, enter editing or insert mode, O to insert lines, D to delete, C to change, Y to copy um, or yank content into a register and P to get it out of that register again. And then we have U to uh, undo stuff and control R to redo changes that we previously un undid. And then there's the period command that simply repeats what you did before. Okay. And again, these editing commands combined with the um, motion commands, um, especially if you use numbers as well to um, do th things repeatedly, are a great way to edit very efficiently, even though you have to switch between insert mode and normal mode all the time. That quickly becomes second nature, and then you can be very efficient uh, in terms of editing. Otherwise, I uh, would never have adopted Vim if I didn't think it would make me more efficient. We've already talked about editing motions uh, by combining editing commands with motion commands. So DW again deletes to the end of the line. D to, uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I meant D dollar sign. Uh, D to W deletes two words. DIW deletes the word you are inside of with your cursor. DT period deletes to the period, but not including the period. DF period would include the period itself, so the period would also um, disappear, and so on and so on. Vim comes with a great um, manual, so by simply uh, executing the command Vim Tutor, you get into um, a tutorial that introduces you to all these things. So if you, if you want to uh, get a little bit deeper into Vim or you want to refresh your memory, uh, Vim Tutor is always a great way to do so. 
in the books, uh, Experiment 10.2 uh, then is a practical application of, 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 of what we've just talked about um, by changing a uh, configuration file. And uh, since that's necessary for later experiments, uh, we are simply going to do that quickly. Let me jump to the experiment. Ten two. That lets us uh, edit the file etsy se linux config. So let's do that. I'll use colon q to exit my file. And now again, Vim doesn't let me exit because I made changes. And I can again force that by entering q exclamation mark. You always need to be more assertive if uh, Vim um, gives you pushback. So uh, let's do that. Um, and uh, since we are going to edit a uh, system configuration file, we need to have root privileges. And that's one of the next topics, actually. Um, I'll simply use the sudo command to... Uh, edit the file etsy se linux config it asks me for my password and that should get me both into root privileges and into the editor this version or this instance of vim now runs with root privileges in this editor i can actually um, change anything i want on the system but uh, of course I just want to edit this single file. And here the default setting is se linux equals dis uh, uh, enforcing, and we'll have to change that to disabled. So the se linux, the secure linux system, doesn't get in the way later um, when we want to do things that uh, se linux would uh, regard as uh, dangerous or um, un insecure. Um, yeah, but I didn't talk about what I do. So uh, I simply used the J key to go um, down here. Actually, let's introduce another neat little thing. Um, searching is quite easy as well. By pressing the slash key in normal mode, I can enter a, uh, a keyword. In this case, I want to jump to the SE Linux line down there. And I don't have any line numbers, so I can do that visually as well by saying jump to the next instance of disabled. Disabled. And it highlights where these um, words are found. So now it jumped to the first instance of disabled above in this text. And by pressing N, I can go to the next location, which gets me in line 10. Now I'm in line 12. And now I'm finally here in uh, line 22 by pressing N repeatedly. And now I can simply use CW to change um, the uh, enforcing to disabled. So let's type that in again. And then I go out of uh, Vim, of course, not without saving first by pressing colon WQ. So that's all pretty easy if you are a little bit familiar with how Vim works. Now I've talked a lot about Vim, but um, I agree with David Both that you should simply use your favorite text editor. There's so many choice out there and I'm, I'm, I'm sure if Vim doesn't do it for you, you'll find something else that will work. You might have to install it on the systems you want to use it on, but uh, still, um, once you have your favorite text editor, really familiarize yourself with it, um, become efficient, and have fun editing files. Uh, it doesn't matter which editor you choose for it in the end, and you'll never be bound for life. Uh, so you can change your editors at any time you like. And uh, that uh, is a very pragmatic approach that I really recommend you take. 
And that's the end of uh, this chapter. I hope um, I was able to interest you in uh, using Vim a little, at least for the um, uh, simple things we are going to do in this course, but also maybe beyond that. And if not, um, I'd be curious uh, which editor you are going to prefer. And if you like, uh, go ahead and uh, once you've found the editor you think you like, um, post it to our community Discord. Um, I'm always curious what editors people use and why they do so. Um, yeah. That's the end of chapter 10. And uh, before we jump to the next chapter, I'll take a short break. I'll see you in a minute. <laughs>